Um, and welcome to the July ASQ Lean Enterprise Division webinar. Um, my name is Manny Veloso. I'm going to be one of the hosts today, and Ellen Erner is going to be joining us shortly. Um, today's webinar is Predictive Quality with Industrial AI for Zero Defects Manufacturing, presented by a gentleman that I've had uh, an opportunity to speak with quite a bit over the last few months. His name is Mo Abali. I think you're going to enjoy this, this webinar quite a bit. Uh, our next webinar is Wednesday, February 10th. Uh, it's going to be Lance Coleman, which is a name that many of you may know, and um, successfully implementing lean in a COVID-19 world. Uh, just a little bit of housekeeping here, folks. So you can expect shortly after the webinar ends to get your RU certificate of attendance. Um, if you did not, then please let me know. I'm going to put my email address into the chat. Uh, just in case that there's any issues or if you have any questions after the fact. If you're looking to get a copy of the presentation itself, the presentation deck, um, you should communicate with Mo Abwali directly, and I'm sure he'll have his contact information as part of the, the uh, presentation. Now, if you want to ask a question, you can do that. Certainly, if you go to what I think of as the GoToWebinar control panel, you can take a look and you'll see questions, and then um, I'll be monitoring that and we'll take questions at the end of the presentation. We expect that Mo's gonna speak for about 40 to 45 minutes, which gives us 15 or 20 minutes for questions. Okay, having said that, I'm not gonna read this introduction out to you, um, but Mo Bali is the CEO and managing partner at IOTCO, the, the Internet of Things company, and uh, I'm gonna let him introduce the rest of his background and let him take over from there. Um, Okay, so I am going to turn it over to you, Mo. Welcome and thank you for being here today. Thank you for the opportunity, Manny. I uh, just want to confirm you hear me well, you see my slide? Absolutely, yes, you're, you're doing well. Five by five, as they say. All right. Yeah, thank you for the opportunity to give this presentation here to the ASQ chapter. Uh, my name is Mo Abuali. Uh, I've been in the industry for about 22 years. And I come from an automotive background, actually, and uh, have been doing uh, IoT, Industry 4.0, predictive maintenance, predictive quality um, uh, in automotive settings and in other manufacturers. So today, my topic is the use of industrial artificial intelligence and uh, predictive quality, specifically, uh, for zero defect manufacturing. Uh, only one slide, just to introduce who we are and why I'm here. Um, I used to work at Toyota in my younger days, and uh, at Toyota, I was actually a maintenance engineer, and I interface also with the quality department. Uh, so at Toyota, I, I had the pleasure of uh, supporting the TPS pillar on uh, maintenance and quality improvements. Um, we focus as an organization on smart factory applications, and the quality is a big area where we play in addition to maintenance. And we, uh, we, we, in a nutshell, are focused on the digital and industrial transformation of manufacturers, okay? We uh, provide consulting and training, you know, similar to the session I'm doing here today. You know, a lot of the content I'm gonna show you is a part of our IoT Academy, which provides uh, training. And uh, we, we work in the data science and predictive analytics uh, area. And I'm gonna talk today about predictive quality, which is focused within PDX. And then we also do other work in the Internet of Things domain. So our DNA is manufacturing. And our, our uh, passion every day is to support manufacturers on their journey towards what we call a zero downtime, zero defect mode of, of operation. So I'm here today to talk about three things. And uh, as many mentioned, at any time, uh, please uh, write your uh, questions in the Q&A. And I'll, I'll do what I can to, uh, to uh, tackle every question at the end of the presentation. So I always like to start with the business case, right? Uh, it's important to understand the, the business side of things and then to start talking about technology. You know, business drives technology adoption. So I'm going to kind of paint the picture of what, what is the business case for uh, predictive quality and predictive analytics. Uh, I'm going to talk about the technology. I'm going to I'm going to have a case study driven presentation. I want to share with you uh, some things that are happening in the in the CPG space, consumer product goods, uh, automotive, 
uh, primarily. And I have some uh, ideas at the end of the presentation uh, on how you could uh, tackle predictive quality and in general quality 4.0. Okay. So let's start with the business case. It's all about productivity improvements. Okay. At the end of the day, uh, it is important to understand what is your why as a business. What is the why? Why are you doing this? Okay. You know, I want to improve quality. Well, that's great. Okay. Um, but how do you measure success, right? So within manufacturing, a key metric is uh, overall equipment effectiveness, um, which is your availability, performance, and uh, quality. Um, you know, a, a lot of you may have heard of this metric. I'm going to focus today more on the quality side of it. Uh, but, you know, improving uptime and improving performance is also key to the operation. Uh, using predictive analytics within a smart factory is usually geared towards uptime improvements, uh, improving spare parts, improving maintenance and labor scheduling activities, right? But our focus today will be more on the detection and reduction of waste, of scrap in the manufacturing sector. So the, the concept of quality 4.0 or predictive quality um, is the key concept that we're gonna be discussing today. Uh, this is an example of, you know, a, a survey actually, survey results um, of some of the manufacturing clients that we work with and the average improvements that they have been able to witness by implementing Industry 4.0 and Smart Factory within their operations, right? Uh, by using tools like uh, process monitoring and artificial intelligence, you know, our manufacturing clients were able to reduce scrap by you know, a fractional 1% up to 5% uh, by, by implementing uh, the right tools, right, and empowering their people to use those tools. At the end of the day, it's about people, process, technology, right? It's a three-legged stool, and it is not just about the success of technology, but it's also about the success of the people and implementing the right process in your operation to drive the results. So, Driving zero downtime and a zero waste uh, manufacturing mindset requires us to always think of the why and to understand the business case. And once the business case is well understood, we're able to start going deeper into the technology and the how of how we can make it happen. I wanna start with two small use cases, okay? Um, both are automotive clients actually, but they have completely different business cases. The, the first business case is geared towards uptime improvements, right? So this automotive manufacturer, they have multiple plants. Um, you know, they have issues with machinery going down. Uh, they're a very high volume operation. Um, you know, their machines are fairly old, legacy machines on the factory floor. So capturing data was always very difficult. And it was very difficult to find spare parts for those machines because they're fairly old, right? So by using a real-time connectivity, sensorizing the line and capturing data using industrial artificial intelligence and advanced analytics, they were actually able to uh, uh, receive an AI Leadership Award in 2019 from the National Association of Manufacturers uh, by implementing AI in, a, in an accelerated way to support their manufacturing operation uh, and to get an ROI within about three to six months. But the use case that I'm going to come back to at the end of this presentation, actually, to conclude the presentation, is focusing on predictive quality of high-pressure die casting. Uh, it's a very unique industry, actually. Um, did you know that the uh, scrap rates, the industry standard, industry norm scrap rates within casting is somewhere between 9 to 15%, okay? So just imagine you're scrapping nine to 15% of your parts and it's considered industry normal. You're doing great. You know? So by, by using industrial AI and the case study that I'll show you at the end of uh, today's presentation and correlating the machine parameters, there's about 40 to 50 casting parameters, every shot, every six seconds and correlating them to the quality output. Am I gonna make a good part? Am I gonna make a scrap, okay? And doing this every six seconds for every shot of aluminum cast going to the machine, right, can be significant ROI for the business. We actually call this project the power of 1% because a fractional 1% reduction in scrap in a, in a casting plant, a mid-sized casting plant, which is about 25 to 40 machines, 
uh, is around uh, a quarter mil in savings per plant per year. Okay, that usually is a is a exceeds 100% ROI for all the you know the software and the infrastructure that you need to put in place to make that happen. But uh, predictive quality uh, is is critical to the businesses today. Okay. Um, there are some gaps, there are some barriers that we're going to talk about to make this uh, example here happen, but it is a mission critical application that allows for the use of advanced analytics, collecting data every cycle of the machine and correlating it to quality and making prescriptive decisions, right? We need to prescribe to the machine every six seconds and tell the machine, are you making a good part or are you making a, a bad part? Uh, we, we call that auto part segregation, actually, on the machine. So there is no need for human involvement, you know. The machine automatically learns and understands if it's making a good part or a bad part, and it is actually scrapping the part automatically. Uh, Bokar actually received the 2020 AI Leadership Award uh, from National Association of Manufacturers uh, last year, and I'll, I'll be shortly presenting that uh, case study today. So what is Quality 4.0? Let's, let's start from the fundamentals, right? Um, there's a lot of definitions out there. Um, you know, I, I, like, I like a very simple definition, actually. Um, and the definition is really the application of the fourth industrial revolution, digital tools, okay, to quality management within the value chain. Uh, quality 4.0 is not just about uh, manufacturing. I mean, my presentation today is focused on manufacturing. But quality 4.0 has many applications across the whole value chain. Okay, um, this is a great study actually. Uh, I can share that with you, uh, but you can Google it online. It's a BCG survey, which was conducted in collaboration with ASQ. And it's showing the top use cases selected by, by survey participants uh, in the factory floor. You know, predictive quality being one of those use cases, but other use cases include the use of machine vision and the use of digital work instructions on the factory floor. So I'm going to focus more here in the green uh, tile, but uh, keep in mind there's there's so much more, you know, and I'm sure some of the web webinars and presentations you guys are going to attend this year are going to focus on other areas of the value chain. So great publication, but it's also important, uh, uh, as with any other strategy, that we create a clear vision and a clear roadmap of what does quality 4.0 mean to your business and the people process technology component to ensure success with quality 4.0. Great publication, uh, BCG ASQ. A simpler definition, uh, which is gonna be the focus of my presentation today is a predictive quality or a PDQ solution detects and diagnoses and predicts deviations in critical process parameters of machinery like casting in order to uh, detect, diagnose, and predict that the, the quality of the actual final product that is being produced, okay? Whether it's an aluminum cast, uh, whether it's an injection molded part, whether it's a CNC machine part, right? So how do we detect, diagnose, and predict quality issues, which obviously are driving uh, improvements in some of the pay points that are related to quality? Cost of scraps are high, okay? Uh, cost of reworking that scrap and the time it takes is also high if, if you're able to rework it. Um, decreased productivity and efficiency, uh, uh, increased time to actually inspect the parts and that leads to loss of time and loss of profits, okay? Just imagine you're making a part every six seconds and you have to go and inspect every part, you know? That's, that's extremely uh, expensive in terms of time and effort for the business. Uh, warranty claims. I'm going to show an example at the end where, you know, the cost of that part as it goes down the value chain from casting to machining to painting, and then it goes to the end user, it's exponentially increasing. And if a bad part goes to the end user, you know, the cost there is priceless. There isn't, you cannot put a price sticker on that because warranty claims and recalls are going to kick in and then it becomes significant loss for the business and potentially reputation issues. So how can we use predictive quality techniques to catch quality issues right at the source, right at the casting machine, right at the CNC machine, right at the molding machine, depending on what is critical for your business, right? So keeping this definition in mind, um, our goal here is to really um, 
create a multivariate model, right? There's a lot of inputs going in that could affect the quality of the part. Um, there are process parameters. There are material properties and characteristics that have an impact. There are product specifications, um, inspection, right? And quality information. We need historical data, right, about inspections to be able to build and train these AI models. Uh, not to mention expert domain knowledge, right, uh, needs to be leveraged into those models to ensure the accuracy of the predictions, all right? Um, so it's, I, I like this definition here, you know, because all these areas, or all these inputs need to be leveraged in the configuration and development of a predictive quality solution in order to be able to uh, support the, the ROI areas and use cases that, that we discussed about shown here. And sometimes it's not easy to capture all those data, right? It's not easy to synchronize all that data and bring them together in one place in a synchronized fashion so you can actually run these models. That's one of the bigger uh, gaps. Uh, but before talking about gaps, uh, you know, the application I'm going to show today is automotive centric and uh, consumer product goods. But uh, many, many applications are out there, right? So think about your business um, in the electronics and the semiconductor industry you know, making chips, right? We had projects where, you know, if you think 40 data parameters in a casting machine every six seconds is a big number, in the semiconductor industry, there's about a thousand chemical-based process parameters, a thousand variables that are collected in uh, milliseconds in some cases that need to be analyzed very quickly, which would indicate the, uh, the quality of the wafer, the semiconductor chips that are being produced in a, in a fab, right, in a fabrication area. So it becomes a big data project and ingesting that data, working with that data, converting that data into actionable information uh, is not an easy task. It, it, it requires analytical solutions that are implemented in a systematic way uh, to improve quality for those, uh, in some cases, heavily regulated manufacturing sectors like semiconductor and food and bev. So what do we need to make this happen, right? Um, and I'll show you the case studies, but I think this is a great summary of all the case studies. Um, you know, we, we need inputs, right? Uh, we need historic product quality data. I mean, to, to model and create any AI type of template, uh, historical data is required. And, uh, you know, in unfortunate cases, this may not be available. So we would have to implement a system and collect that historic data, right, in a synchronized fashion. Um, expert domain knowledge is always key initially to understand the different product IDs that are running on the machine. Every product ID has different thresholds, different material characteristics, and so on and so forth. That needs to become part of the data map or the data model that I'm injecting into my, uh, my AI, my analytics. And availability of key signals, right? So we can do this offline, but how can I implement this online? Um, you know, how can I implement this uh, with direct integration to the PLC on my machine, on my line, and uh, an image camera that's on the cell, and being able to handshake the machine data and the quality data, right? So the connectivity, the infrastructure is, is a key, uh, you know, area that needs to be prepared for us to be able to run these solutions online. So what is the output? I mean, obviously, we're predicting part quality, right? green, yellow, red. Is this going to be a good part predicted? Is this going to be a bad part? But in some cases, there are suspects, right? You know, we call them yellows. Uh, and, uh, you know, to be conservative, to be cautious, you know, those greens and yellows are rejected, you know, and, and are inspected. Uh, or sorry, the yellows and reds, you know, the suspects and the rejects are rejected and the green can pass, right? So that's predictive part quality. And of course, what is required to empower the shop floor personnel and the quality people to access that data? Um, you know, these dashboards are mission critical because we're talking about making real-time decisions on part quality on the shop floor. Um, and warnings and alarm thresholds are also key. Um, you know, the sensitivity of those thresholds to reduce, you know, uh, you know, false alarms and uh, false positives and things of that sort. Uh, need to be properly validated uh, and to ensure the prediction accuracies are, are high, right? Um, so these are the types of events 
um, that usually happen that lead to quality issues in a typical manufacturing environment. I mean, process parameters, like in the casting or molding uh, application that I briefly mentioned, I mean, a drift on those parameters um, can lead to issues. And I mean, mind you, clients today are using SPC products, right? Statistical process control. But in many cases, those SPC solutions are looking at a single variable at a time. And the use of predictive quality enables us to use AI and to use a multivariate approach that looks at all the parameters being collected, 40 parameters, 1,000 parameters, and making correlations. And uh, you know, SPC um, is, is usually not geared towards that. So predictive quality is a natural extension of, of using SPC on the factory floor. So with this short introduction you know, on some thoughts around what is quality 4.0 and what is predictive quality, um, I'd, I'd like to browse through some case studies and, and then give you a, a short kind of motivating conclusion at the end. Um, you know, let, let's start here, okay? Regardless of how you do it, the architecture is always a three-piece architecture. There is a data lake, there is a industrial AI application, and then there are use cases that are delivering the user experience and the decisions to the end user, right? So we're talking about what is the relevant synchronized data for predictive quality? We're talking about asset-related data coming from the machine control, um, we're talking about process parameters, like the temperatures and the pressures and the critical variables that indicate quality. We're talking about quality characteristics. Um, you know, some of them come from the machine. Some of them may need add-on sensors, like uh, image data, for example, or even video data in some applications. And then we're talking about, you know, ingesting that data, synchronizing it, making sure it's labeled in a proper way for the application. Um, and then starting to correlate the machine data with the quality parameters and delivering use cases for the client. So when it comes to predictive quality, we're talking about two key metrics here. We're talking about part health, green, yellow, red, good part, suspect part, reject part, okay? So just imagine converting all that data into a decision on part health, okay? And the process behind it that I'm gonna show. And then defect prediction and diagnosis, actually, missing word here. What is the root cause, right? Why, why is this a suspect part? Why is this a reject part? Is it my temperature signal? Is it my pressure signal? Is it which variables or which part of the process is impacting the quality issues on my machine, right? So now if we take this and we look at the actual process that makes it happen, it is important to follow a systematic process, right? So the process starts with data collection. It goes into preparing that data, ingesting it, processing it, making sure the data is usable, right? Um, some data is noisy, some data requires outlier removals, filtration, and other techniques. And then feature engineering, you know, extracting metrics, statistical metrics from the raw data that are meaningful, that are highly correlated between the process and the quality, the machine and the quality, right? That's the handshake that we have here. And then training an AI model that allows us to assess the health of the part. What is green? What is yellow? What is red mean? What is part health, right? And you know, some of the applications we do are data-driven applications. They are multivariate. The 40 parameters, you know, 100 parameters come into the system. Meaningful, highly correlated features are extracted. And then we're able to create a model based on this. So it's like a fingerprint. This is a fingerprint of a good part. This is a fingerprint or a signature of a part scrap. And it could be scrap type A, type B, type C, type D. You got different types of scrap modes that occur in the manufacturing operation, right? So once you have you know, that labeled data, that correlated data, the solution learns actually. It learns those signatures. And that's your training. That's the training of the AI model. And then it's you're able to start doing prediction. Of course, every prediction comes with a caveat, which is the accuracy of the prediction, right? Um, you know, we, we need to work towards a, a high confidence interval of prediction, usually beyond 95%, because you don't want to start, uh, you know, letting good parts uh, be rejected or letting reject parts uh, be accepted, right? False positives, false negatives. So, you know, there is an amount of training data required to get these systems working 
for each type of scrap that happens on the factory floor. And usually, usually uh, we need about four weeks of baseline data, okay, for each part ID. So I'm not talking about years of data. I'm talking usually about four weeks of each type of baseline. Um, and, and then diagnosis, right? What is the root cause? And I'll show you some examples of how we're, we're finding the root cause, which parameters, which signals are actually uh, leading to the quality issue. So the, um, the challenge here is, you know, when you go into manufacturing, um, it, it is not just about robots, right? It's about, I have robotics, I have CNCs, I have casting and welding and molding, I have stamping, right? Different parts, different processes. So the systematic approach still stands, it's still the same, but there is a series of templates that need to be created, right? Each one of these assets has a different behavior, different type of parts, um, has a different data map, right? Uh, there are specific parameters that indicate uh, quality of a spot weld on a robot or a laser weld on a robot, right? There are specific parameters that indicate casting issues or, you know, my CNC machine has a tool. My tool is creating the surface texture, surface roughness uh, of my part, right? So if there's a degradation in my tool or spindle, I'm going to start having a part with a bad surface uh, roughness in a, in a precision industry like aerospace. So many, 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 many examples. So my message here is it's important to apply the systematic process in different ways to allow the user to understand the specific data map and to have that analytics workflow that I showed from signal to feature to part health, part prediction, and part diagnosis in a systematic way, okay? And you know these things have been well studied over the years. I'm I'm not uh, telling you this is a new field, right? Uh, you know, uh, this field has been around for many years, decades actually. But now with the faster computational speeds and the ability to implement the solutions online versus offline, it is actually uh, speeding the implementation timeframe significantly uh, on on the factory floor. So some of the challenges are usually around the the infrastructure and the connectivity and and uh, uh, client type of responsibilities, but those challenges can be can be mitigated. So I'm going to browse through some case studies, okay? And I'm going to start with a case study from a CPG manufacturer. Um, you know, this CPG manufacturer, um, you know, started to have some issues with warranty claims on their ovens okay they make ovens maybe you have their ovens in your uh, in your houses and also dishwashers okay and clients were calling and saying hey uh, uh when my dishwasher heats you know it's cleaning my dishes my uh, over time my door starts to crack okay so just imagine you're running your dishwasher and you know a few months later cracks happen on the dishwasher due to the heat and the material fatigue right not a good problem to have phone call, phone call, phone call, service, service, warranty issues, recalls, right? So we, we went in uh, this application and we looked at the process and the process had a steel coil, there's a forming station and a line, and then there are finished ribs like the one you see here, right? And then there is a, a defined data map, you know? We need data from the coils, data from the forming stations, and then quality data regarding the finished ribs. And we wanna implement an online system for predictive quality that is predicting with the highest level of accuracy right on the manufacturing floor, whether you're gonna make an oven with a cracked door or whether this oven is okay to ship to the customer, okay? So to make this happen, there, there's a data map, right? Remember my picture? There's a data map, there's analytics, and then there's a deliverable, right? So I need to understand the material properties of that steel you know, going into my line, okay, number one, because different material properties exhibit different, you know, behaviors on the manufacturing floor. I need data from my forming station. I need the operational parameters and I need specific sensor readings, right? And then that data needs to be correlated with the final product check. So there's a history of the final project check, product check, and there's a history of some of the warranty recalls that occurred, the serial numbers that were back traced, so, you know, let me summarize it by saying there's a traceability system, right? And traceability is very important when it comes to predictive quality. Um, you need to be able to serialize your parts or with a QR or a label, 
And that part in a manufacturing setting is usually traced. So there's an electronic trace record that tells you every operation, process parameter, person. It's like a birth record of the part, birth certificate of the part. So now when the, when the predictive quality template is implemented, it's, it's looking at the target quality, right? And it's making predictions on recommended uh, operation settings off the line that allows me to maximize quality and to reduce scrap on the line. So this is not just predicting defects on the line, but it's actually being prescriptive and making recommendations on what is the best offset parameters. My recipe that's running the line, right? What's the best recipe parameters? And in some cases, we have clients that are feeding those recipe parameters back to the line, to the PLC, automatically, okay? So the line is always running in a balanced way with, with the best recipe settings and with the, with the most optimized uh, quality checks, all right? So again, it's a maturity scale, right? We start with data collection, we go into predictive quality, and then we go into prescriptive uh, decision-making or prescriptive quality. This is just an example, um, some of the information that is being accessed. Um, you know, your, the rib height is key, so you're able to monitor the rib height over time, and you're able to, to view that. And, uh, you know, it is a multivariate system, of course, but you can go deeper and you can look at each uh, variable and the impact of the rib height to the deviations of the variable, okay? But more importantly, you see a heat map. If I'm the quality engineer, right, quality manager of this line, I see a heat map and I'm able to diagnose the relationship between the process parameter and the predicted quality or defect on the line. All the reds here are actually defective oven doors that have been rejected on the line. In real time, the solution has made a decision to reject them. And then the, you know, we are um, visualizing this in, in, in a type of user-friendly mode to the quality manager so they understand the you know uh, temperature zones right here where there is usually an issue with the with the oven door right like a temperature of less than 120 degrees usually has quality issues on the oven right um, the you know for those who might be interested actually we were able to hit almost an 88 90 percent prediction precision accuracy on this uh, on this application uh, which actually you know, exceeded significantly the previous uh, uh, quality uh, rates uh, or quality accuracies that were uh, in place prior to the system being in place. But at the end of the day, to make the system work, right, um, we need specific data map that makes sense. We need correlation to the quality labels and quality parameters on the line. And we, we need that business case that we're trying to solve, which is, hey, I have an issue on the specific uh, oven type and uh, um, there are warranty and recall issues. How can I immediately tackle that problem and use advanced analytics? Another example is from the automotive industry. Um, similar use case. You know, if you're interested in the slides, just please email me at the end and I'm happy to share them with you. But the motivation here is, uh, is a little bit different, okay? And I can talk to it. Um, you know, these guys are making uh, aluminum wheels. If you look at your car, your tires, you got four tires, that the hubs and the rims right in the middle are actually produced by this automotive tier supplier. And nowadays it's mostly aluminum, right? Because of the uh, light weighting of the vehicles. Um, low pressure casting is, is a key application in this industry, okay? And in a low pressure casting machine, you're talking about 30 to 40 key process parameters. And you know, there's a robot that picks up the part and then lets it go to the machining and uh, takes it first to the X-ray. But you know, due to the volume of the wheels, right? I'm making a wheel every 15 seconds. I cannot inspect every wheel. There's an X-ray machine that inspects, but the inspection time is long, and I have to inspect in a more uh, selective manner, right? Um, so they started making a lot of scrap, more than normal, actually. And we, we implemented a predictive quality solution that, that took historical data from the X-ray, which is kind of pass-fail, and the casting parameters. And we, uh, we implemented a model, a predictive quality model, that could easily display and auto-reject wheels that are non-conforming, okay? And if you see here, uh, imagine you're running this casting cell, 
and you're seeing this in real time. Uh, green is actually a, a acceptable wheel. It's a good part. Yellow is a warning uh, or a suspect wheel that could be bad because the accuracy you know, of the model didn't uh, show confidence. And then red is a high prediction of a quality issue. Uh, so it, it is it is visual. You can do remove the wheels manually from the line and auto reject them. Or in this case, the robot is actually automated to auto reject the wheels. But the more important thing here is actually the diagnosis. Okay, if if I take my mouse and hover over this red one, the reason that this wheel was uh, rejected is um, the temperature of thermocouple number one on the cell and the pressure cooling flow number six. Right where the two parameters from this multivariate analysis uh, that is running every 15 seconds on the line, a wheel every 15 seconds, but those two parameters are actually the contributing factors to this specific reject. So now that the client knows the, the reason for those rejects, there is re, you know, reporting capability and the client can go deeper into the software to understand, you know, why, am I keep, why do I keep getting bad wheels? that are related to the temperature of thermocouple one, you know, or the pressure cooling flow six. And then there is some, um, you know, PDCA, plan, do, check, act, countermeasure activity that the quality team can do to start making reductions in those wheels. So if such a system is not in place, some of those wheels may go to the x-ray, but some may not go to the x-ray actually, and they may end up slipping to the next process, and they don't get caught until final inspection after they're machined and after they're painted, right? And now it's extremely costly to rework uh, those parts back into the system, right? So how do I improve velocity, right? I wanna make more parts, but I also wanna make uh, more good parts that are shipped to the client in a timely fashion. This is just an example of the root cause analysis behind it. Uh, most important thing is, you know, the prediction accuracy is about 96%, okay? Um, about, about again, about four weeks of training data is required for a good wheel and for different scrap type wheels, right? But once that training data is accumulated and the models are trained and validated, usually those those type of solutions could achieve about a, a 90, 95 percent plus uh, prediction accuracy. Again, very applicable to many industries. Again, this is automotive, but I showed CPG, you know, semiconductor industry. Uh, think about some of those applications uh, for your industry, for the for the folks on the call. Uh, last case study, and if again, if you have questions, just please drop them in, and we'll come back to them. But uh, uh, high pressure die casting is is key in the automotive industry, and this is a good concluding case study because it goes back to our early conversation about business case. Uh, business case drives everything, uh, especially in these industries where the margins are extremely slim. You know, automotive industry margins are extremely sensitive. And if, if I'm catching quality issues in the foundry, okay, um, the cost to rework, maybe remelt the part, is about 3.8 bucks. Okay, but look at how it jumps, right? If I catch the quality issue in machining, if I catch it in the assembly area afterwards when I'm doing painting and assembly, and if it goes to the customer, you know. Um, not to mention the warranty recall claims that may potentially uh, come out of this. So um, it, it's important to understand your costs per part and per scrap part across the value stream and to be able to put uh, such solutions in place right at the source of quality issues, which is usually the foundry, okay? And if they're caught in the foundry, um, you're, you're able to completely minimize quality issues across the rest of your value stream. Um, you know, early scrap detection, um, as, as we call it, right? Early scrap detection and prediction early in the value stream uh, can easily provide in the casting industry, you know, as I had mentioned before, about a quarter mil savings per, uh, per, an, per annum, per, per plant, okay? So keeping the business case in mind, this is a bit more of an advanced case study. Um, there, there's a lot more moving parts, okay? Um, you know, there, there's about 50 casting parameters for every shot that, that I had mentioned briefly earlier, right? Every six seconds, there's an aluminum cast shot uh, into the cavity, and there's 50 parameters collected from the PLC, okay? 
some of the key parameters are actually listed here. The you know, pressures, the air flows, the temperatures, the oil levels. Uh, some of the data, by the way, can be used for predictive maintenance of some of the key assets here, like the trim press, you know, the dye, the dosing furnace. But the, the parameters um, uh, exhibit different thresholds for different product IDs that run on the machine. And by the implementing AI and a multivariate analysis of those 50 parameters, we're able with a high level of accuracy to correlate them uh, to the part quality and, and make prescriptive decisions on the machine. So the outcome of the project was actually, you know, both a predictive and prescriptive quality uh, application uh, where within every six seconds, there's an auto part segregation, okay? So, you know, right here, if you notice, these are kind of all the variables or the top variables that are being collected. And if, if a single, if any variable is a red, this part is rejected, okay? And if multiple variables are yellow, you know, the part is also rejected. So there's, there's specific rules, right? Based on the AI that is running and the learning that allows us to, you know, reject this part here, which is running on cell one, and let this part pass, which is running on cell two. Uh, but the science of making this happen is, again, having the right data synchronized and labeled, connectivity to that PLC, right? And, uh, and training the models with the right data for, for each type of good part and each scrap part. So the training of the models when it comes to PDQ is a bit more intense, but once it is done once, it, it actually would run for, for a lifetime and it would deliver value to the business. Uh, so this is a mission critical solution actually. Quality 4.0, you know, unlike predictive maintenance, um, quality 4.0 is mission critical. It's actively predicting, actively pres prescribing action within seconds. It's an online solution. Um, you know, with predictive maintenance, uh, it might take time for my machine to fail. It might take a day, it might take a week or a month, right? But with quality 4.0, I am making decisions for every product that is being produced on that machine. So, so a short summary, um, and I hope uh, this was useful for the, for the audience here. Um, I, I want to start with this, you know. Um, I, I love this. If you have not seen this, LNS Research in 2017 published uh, Quality 4.0 Impact, okay? Um, if you reach out to me for the presentation, I can also send this to you. You, you may have seen this. It might look busy, you know, but I, I love one sentence here. There is one uh, key sentence. Manufacturers looking to improve quality should assess where they stand on each of these 11 axes, okay? It is likely that many companies will need to make investments first in traditional quality before they can leverage uh, quality 4.0. I 100% agree, okay? Every manufacturer has a different level of digital maturity or quality maturity. You cannot just you know, go in without even having a proper quality procedure I don't even use an SPC system in my in my shop, you know, but I'm gonna go put predictive quality on my casting machine. Sorry, you know, it's it's a recipe for failure, unfortunately. There are fundamental quality things that you know through ASQ and so on and so forth that must be in place to be successful going beyond and using AI and implementing quality 4.0 solutions. So I, I think that's a very important point to make. Uh, foundation is key for success in, uh, in predictive quality or quality 4.0. Um, but there's also a way to be successful, right? And I'll, I'll keep this brief, but you know, th there is an assessment phase. I need to understand uh, my baseline. I need to understand my maturity level, right? Um, there are workshops that look at gaps, my people, my process, my technology, what's my maturity level. It's good to think big, but we have to start small. We have to find a proof of value. Okay, it's not a proof of concept. This is a proof of value with a business case, a business ROI justification, and the technology that makes sense for your business. And business plus technology when implemented, deliver value for your business. This is a proof of value. And this should not run for six months to one year. This should run for about two to three months, okay? It's very focused, success criteria. People process technology will, will make you successful. And then you learn and scale those solutions. And those solutions you could potentially learn and scale internally within your organization, right? 
So find your proof of value, assess your maturity, and uh, make sure you have the foundations for quality 4.0, which is traditional quality, right? Um, that allows you to then go beyond and embark on using advanced analytics and predictive quality solutions uh, to detect, diagnose, and predict de deviations in your critical assets, right? Uh, so I, um, I hope today was useful for everybody. Um, please reach out to me. My email is simple, uh, abuali at iotco.com, A-B-U-A-L-I. If you're in front of a computer now, just type me an email, say send presentation, I'll send it to you. And uh, you know, link with me and uh, let's stay connected. And I think I'm on time, Manny. We got 15 minutes for questions, sir. Yes, Mo, you're, you're doing very nicely. Um, so I would encourage folks to do a couple things. One is I put out my email address in the chat. So uh, if you've got any questions or concerns about the webinar, you need some information, you can contact me directly. Uh, Mo is showing his email address. Thank you for that. Mo, I got to tell you, this was a pretty cool presentation. Um, easy to, to understand for someone who doesn't know an awful lot about the topic. And uh, I, I feel like, yeah, I could be successful with it. Uh, we do have some questions. I would encourage some more questions, please. Uh, and we will answer all the ones that we can uh, in the time available. So um, anything else you want to say before we get into questions, Mo? Or shall we shall we uh, get started okay let's do that then so um, somebody asked if there were any examples or case studies from the elevator and escalator industry um, to me that just I don't know if it's industry specific so much as it is process specific though I mean any thoughts yeah that's a good question we have done work in the elevator industry um, uh, to be honest, it's more related to predictive maintenance of the elevator door and the elevator you know, shaft and so on. It's obviously a safety critical piece of equipment. But I would say quality here is a bit of a different flavor. It's, it's more of predicting you know, the energy usage actually of the elevator. So it's not the quality of the part. You know, the impact is usually the energy used by the elevator. So different flavor here, but uh, same approach actually, same, same systematic approach. But the connectivity, the data map, and uh, the energy side of it, I would say, is, is more applicable than uh, quality. Well, I think there you're talking about the elevator in use versus the elevator being manufactured. I mean, everything you talked about Correct. still applies to manufacturing. So, okay. Yep. Another question. Are trends and shifts identified using predictive quality? Um, yeah, they certainly so are. The um, okay. I think the diagnosis component or the root cause analysis of the PDQ is important. I mean, these models are showing you predictions that you're going to make a good or a bad part, but there has to be a reason behind, you know, the model accepting or rejecting, right? So you, you would see trends from the data and you would see trends also from the features, which are the metrics and the statistics of the data. And those trends uh, would typically tell you um, you know, more insights, uh, like the example of the casting company I talked about, you know, they realize they're rejecting a lot of wheels because the temperature on a specific thermocouple, like thermocouple number one, was always giving them a problem. So that, that helped them with the root, of, root cause investigation. And then it turned out that there is some issues on the machine that they were able to investigate based on that. So yes, trends and shifts are definitely identified and you have to act based on, based on the information. Got it. Okay. I've got a comment and two questions. Comment was great presentation and examples that bring clarity to the topic. First question, does every application of the AI require a unique programming effort or has programming grown to a place where checkboxes allow you to a la carte the program to serve the intent? Yeah. Yeah. And I, I can see the question actually. It's a good question. Um, okay. I mean, we, we've, we've moved into the, a more template based approach of doing things. You know, initially you do have to configure and train models and, and so on and so forth. But there are tools out there today that, that allow you to configure that recipe without any programming, actually. It's, it's what I call a no-code environment. Um, so those templates do allow for a no-code environment. Uh, yeah, reach out to me. Happy to offer you more, uh, more information. And then second question from this person. Does the AI function allow us to improve the manufacturing process so that scrap continues to be reduced? 
that is the goal. And the best way to do this is to start to be prescriptive, actually, and to take the human out of the loop and start feeding data back directly to the process uh, to offset the recipes and improve the line performance. So that's the natural maturity or extension of these models to become more prescriptive. So in this case, you would surely continue, you know, having uh, scrap reductions and, and optimizations on the line. And I guess as you continue to refine your model and really get to the edges of the data, what's good, what's bad, you, you, it gets better in a predictive fashion, more information you have, right? Okay. Um, comment, amazing how the technology has evolved to enable significant significant quality improvements. I would say, Manny, it's also amazing how uh, a lot of people are not adopting it. <laughs> well, not invented here. I mean, there's all sorts of reasons, right? So, what I just said today, guys, in the last 60 minutes is things that have been happening over the last 20 years, two zero. But now it is uh, fueled by improving in computation speed, uh, reduction in the cost of storage, you know, cloud networking. So, hey, if you're not adopting this today, start adopting it now because your competitor is. So I suspect I know the answer to this question, too. It's a bunch like savings. But the question is, when is the best time to implement, especially in a startup? Uh, would, you, would you do a first I, I, thing or would you stabilize your process and then implement or what would you do? It's a good question. I think it goes to my conclusion there where there are some fundamentals that you have to have in place. There is traditional quality tools that, you know, ASQ uh, delivers very well, um, you know, anywhere from your, your process, your people being trained, the use of connectivity, the use of SPC tools, those fundamentals need to be in place and then it would allow you to go beyond uh, into the predictive quality realm. Okay, um, another question, examples for the medical device industry, are there any? Many, 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 many. A lot of CNC machines, a lot of EDM machines making good medical uh, parts with very precision parts. You know, I, I would say uh, a lot of the applications around CNC machine, predictive quality, a um, little bit of robotic predictive quality, uh, injection molding predictive quality. I did not touch upon them today. You know, please reach out to me. But a, a lot of templates available for the uh, med device industry. I know, there's never enough time to cover everything, right? And they're very mature. Oh. What I love about MedDevice is that they're very mature about the data acquisition and the connectivity in many cases because they're heavily regulated. Yeah, they definitely have to show lots of things. Uh, here's a question. How could this be applied to transactional processes, let's say maybe in banking or possibly healthcare? Um, I, I, I'm sure it can, but you know, Ron, I'm a manufacturing guy. I got oil in my blood, so I would not be able to answer your question. man. Okay, could be an um, interesting extension of the technology. Um, another one, obviously, does PDQ apply to a final assembly operation where the vast majority of parts are purchased from various suppliers? That could be possible, and I give you a, a small example. Think about image data. There is a lot of uh, image analytics for the final end-of-line assembly that are taking pictures of parts, and we're doing uh, predictive quality on the image data. I think that's a very wise application and the use of sensor technology in the final assembly area. Okay. Yeah, I guess also you could use um, sensors of various types to see if something is inserted fully or, or whatnot. So. Correct. Um, another one about the assessment, is there a guideline or can you give an example about how to assess the actual process and the needed information to obtain? Yeah, it was actually in the beginning of my presentation, you know, um, we, we would need to look at uh, material type of data, process type of data, quality inspection type of data. So there is a defined data map, which I think was in a, a beginning slide that I had shown. Um, happy to discuss that with you further. But in many cases, you have the data map, but the issue is it is not synchronized together. You got system A, system B, system C, and the labels are not synchronized. So there is a bit of a data preparation synchronization work that happens in the beginning to make sure that the proper data goes into the models. That's kind of the challenge there. Okay, we've got a couple of questions about costs. Um, talking about ROI uh, or the, the startup cost. Can, can you talk a little bit about that perhaps? A mid-size casting plant saves 250K per plant per year by just improving scrap by 1%. 
and the cost of the software and the infrastructure and the services combined is less than 250k so that's your roi so you're saying less than a year i mean months maybe less depending than a on year absolutely possible. less than a year i would say predictive quality roi is even much more uh, tangible than predictive maintenance roi you could you could give a hard quantification so the roi justifications of pdq are are very uh, very much you know in line with the six to 12 month ROI within manufacturers. And we have sample ROI calculations I can share. If you reach out to me and come your industry type, I can give you some examples. Yeah. Okay, um, I have a couple of questions related to case studies or application for autonomous robotic space. I think Elizabeth, sorry, we asked at the bottom, what is the cost of the tech? The cost of the tech is, is you know, in a mid-sized plant is usually under uh, somewhere between 100 to 200k. Uh, so, but that includes the software, the services, and the training, and the internal infrastructure of the client. Um, and the ROI is is usually within less than 12 months. Okay. And I'm sorry, going back to your question again, um, Manny. Uh, about case studies or use cases for autonomous uh, robotic space. We have done some work in the cobots realm, the collaborative robots area. We've done work in the traditional industrial robots um, where we've looked at the spot welding quality, the laser welding quality, friction welding quality. So basically when the robot moves and it degrades, the, sometimes it impacts the quality of the weld or the quality of the material handling. So that is a predictive quality application. Um, I hope that helps. I'm not sure what autonomous means, but that's a, an example of a robotic application. No, I think you hit it pretty well. Um, folks, we have some time for some more questions. Uh, I have one. Uh, Mo, can you tell us a little bit about what volume of production might be viable in this case? I mean, I can see where you're doing high volume, heavy automation, but um, a lot of my clients don't look like that. Yeah, yeah, it's a good question. Um, you know, we do definitely see high volume manufacturers as a key uh, participant in this type of technology, but uh, more and more aerospace and defense providers where they're making precision machine parts, very long cycle times, you know, they're making one-offs, but there is an impact of the machining parameters to the, the surface roughness or the surface texture of the part that they're, uh, that they're aerospacing on a CNC machine, for example. So definitely an application in the uh, you know, high mix, low volume industry where you need precision and the parts are going to a safety critical type of industry like on a jet airplane, you know? There's definitely an application there. Okay, got you. Uh, so I have another question here. It's any comments or tips on winning over folks on the floor and that are directly managing the processes? where many are historically reacting or operating in a more reactionary mode and the business case itself may not be a selling point? Hmm. Yeah, we actually just released an article I can share with you about the people side of things. Um, um, uh, it, it's kind of, it's, it's, I think it's called five tips, you know, to, to involve people in digital uh, manufacturing. And I can share that article with you. But I, I think long story short, um, you know, fostering a culture of innovation um, having a multidisciplinary team, uh, setting up a steering digital committee, right? Especially in the larger organization, there needs to be a corporate and plant level representatives that talk to each other. There must be a feeling of empowerment, right? And, uh, you know, the feeling of solutions being shoved down by corporate is usually not well taken. It's, it doesn't become successful. So I have five or six tips I can share with you that we are, we've published in an article this month. Um, but, but again, it's, it's a multidisciplinary approach and I would tell you people process technology, you will only be as successful as the weak link or the weakest link. And in most cases, unfortunately, technology is not successful because people are not involved or trained or empowered in the right way within the project. <clears throat> All right. I think we've got time for one more question. Uh, so somebody works, uh, in, in sheet metal facility with press breaks. So they use the same tools to make lots of different parts. They have over a thousand parts available. Can it be utilized on the tooling itself or, um, and it's small runs. So I guess it relates yeah. back to the previous question. 
Yeah, we can look at the process. I mean, right now we're doing a brake press project with an uh, industrial manufacturer called uh, Train Technologies, Ingress Oran, and the large press brakes. But the key issue is actually uptime because it's a high volume machine. And, uh, you know, uptime is an issue, right? You're losing parts. So we're doing predictive maintenance on the key critical components of the press brake. We have not looked into predictive quality yet uh, on that machine. Um, but, but to be honest, I would have to talk to you a bit more and do a discovery to understand uh, how we can correlate this to quality. I unfortunately can't, can't think of anything off the top of my mind today. Yeah. Sure, it can be tough. And, and, you know, honestly, I mean, we get questions that are 10 words or so. It's, it's hard to know sometimes what the intent of the question is. Yeah, it is a good right, question, folks. though. I'm happy to explore it further. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Folks, I can tell you again, after having um, worked with and talked to Mo for months, he's very approachable. Uh, even though he has a PhD, his head's not in the clouds. Um, feel free to reach out and talk to him. I think he would welcome the connections, uh, not to mention um, just just that's being him being him. So it's the top of the hour, folks. We are going to shut off this particular webinar. Thank you again, Mo. We've gotten several thanks, several great presentations. Uh, I would echo that. Uh, as a reminder, you're going to get your RU cert certificates should occur automatically within 24 hours. If not, feel free to email me directly. My email is in the chat. And um, we'll be posting the video by Friday, most likely by tomorrow. So, uh, oh, thank you again. If you want to hang on for a little bit, then we'll let everybody else go about the rest of their day. Thank you for uh, your time and attention. It's much appreciated. Have a great Thank day. Thank you for folks. the opportunity, man, and the team.